Hi, I'm Cher Kaufman. I'm international author and artist of the Artful Mandala coloring book and the Ancient Alchemy coloring book. And today, I'm going to be sharing some tips on colored pencils. Okay, welcome to this segment about colored pencils. Today I'm going to show you five different pencils uh, that are common pencils to find in either art supply stores or at a local supermarket or someplace like that where you can have access to colored pencils. Because most coloring book artists would rather have you coloring than waiting for that special tool. Now special tools are nice and I will show you a couple of examples of special tools but it is more of our heart's desire that you are coloring and enjoying and having fun. So these five pencils right here are the most common that people come in contact with. I've got the Premier Prismacolor, the Crayola, the Fine Touch, which is one that is, this is a, a double-sided pencil here. The Fine Touch is at Hobby Lobby. The Up and Up, this is a brand that is found at Target. And the Artist Loft, Artist Loft is the one that's at uh, Michaels. So there are some art supply ones here and also some ones that are at your general retail stores. So these I want to show you. They appear to go onto the paper fairly consistently. There's no real change with just me taking the side of it and, and pressing uh, a real light application down onto the paper. You can see they all put their, their uh, wax residue on the paper and get the desired color that we're looking for. But pencils do vary. They do have different consistencies, they have different softness, and they have different hardness levels that make a big difference on your end result of what you are looking for for your, your coloring page. Prismacolor is a really great example of a pencil that colorists really like to use because it is soft. So when I say soft, it means that the way that the wax is inside the wood casing, when it is applied to the paper, it leaves a lot of the wax onto the paper. So it is considered a softer pencil, which means that it does not take much application or much pressure on, on, from me to put down the color that I want. And this is really great when it comes to blending. A pencil that might be on the harder side, like this fine touch, means that it puts it down, but it's actually more appropriate for detail because I can get into tiny little spaces and really control how much is left onto the paper because a hard pencil does not leave as much wax on the paper. And the same thing actually applies to a graphite pencil. The harder the pencil, the less that it leaves down. The softer the graphite, the more it leaves down, which is why in, in graphite pencils they have them marked H is hard and B is the softer levels for graphite. And so there are different hardnesses and softnesses for how these can be applied to your advantage when you're coloring. Now I do want to show you these two here. There is, this. these are old old pencil manufacturers. They have been around for a very long time. These two companies really know how to make their pencils. And so if you decide that you want to explore more of the fancier side of pencils, I suggest that you either invest in some Prismacolor, uh, Faber-Castell, or the Coronor. These are these are different, they're different hardnesses and softness and the way the wax is applied. These two here, the Prismacolor and the Coronor is going to be softer and the Faber-Castell is a little bit harder. Now there are a couple of different, here's your three, there are a couple of different schools of thought in, in comparison. A lot, of two, a lot of people like to compare the Faber-Castell and the Prismacolor together because they can work very similarly in the way that they blend. They, they both have really nice blending abilities. One thing though is that the Faber-Castell is a little bit harder. Now that is not a negative. That can be a positive. When there is a little bit more of a hardness, it means that you can 
have more layering opportunities because the softness lays down so much, the Faber-Castell actually allows you to blend more than one color in a different way than the Prismacolor because it lays down so much. So I will show you a little bit about blending, but just a tiny bit in, um, in another example coming up. This one I do want to show you. This pencil here is what they call a tritone. So in a tritone, you'll notice there are three bands of color here. That means that in the wax itself, there are three different waxes that are in here. Now, when you go to draw, the coloring is the blended effect of all of these. So if I were to take a bunch of different colors together, say I mixed these all together this way, that's what this one pencil does, is that it's taking several different colors and putting it into a single pencil. You're going to get a blended effect. It's not necessarily going to be as separate as using three different pencils, but for those that like to play with something that might be of interest or difference, this is kind of a cool little pencil to play with this way. And they have different colors. There's reds and, and yellows and, and different things. It usually comes in a set. But I just wanted to let you know that the end result is usually kind of a softer color. It's not that you can see these individually very strongly. And then just as a quick reminder, the harder the pencil, the more detail you can get. The softer the pencil, the more that you can apply for softening and blending. Okay, here I have a Prismacolor base, which means I just took my Prismacolor pencil and I did a whole bunch right across here. And I wanted to show you what each one of those examples look like when they blend on top of the Prismacolor. The reason why this is important is that every manufacturer has its own way of creating a pencil, which means that the binding agents that are inside the pencil, the wood casing that is used, here are three different pencils that this is the end of the pencil and I want to just bring something to your attention about how to look for whether the wax is where it's supposed to be. Now in this pencil that's here, this is a Faber-Castell and it actually has a capped end which means you can't really see the end. But these two here are Prismacolor and I want to bring your attention to this purple one. If you look closely you'll notice that the wax is not actually in the center. There is less wood on this side than there is on this side, which means it is not exactly in the center. If you see a pencil where there is a thinner side and a thicker side, that could cause problems in the future as you begin to sharpen your pencil down, because what that means is that there will be a weaker side to your pencil and a stronger side to your pencil. If you happen to be a type of colorist that puts a lot of pressure when you're coloring, then if you happen to be putting pressure on that weaker side, you can create some issues with your tool, with your pencil. If you are a person that colors lightly, you probably won't have a problem, but you'll just need to be mindful of when you are sharpening, that that pencil might need a little bit more care, being careful when to, uh, being careful not to sharpen too quickly to actually take your time so you can monitor the wax end of it. So I will talk a little bit about pencil care in just a second, but I, I do want to mention about um, being, being aware of when you're sharpening your pencil, that if there's breakage, just to watch to see if the wax is down in the center. Now the binding agents that they use, sometimes you can get a nice combination of using cross-reference or cross-coloration of different pencils. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. When I use the Crayola over the top of the Prismacolor, my experience has been that sometimes I can get away with, in, with blending those together and I get a soft combination and they still work well together. Other times I have found that the Crayola has a little bit harder wax and does not always blend well with the Prismacolor. So it's something I kind of have to play with and see how it works depending on what I'm coloring. These three here, the Fine Touch, the Up and Up, and the Artist's Loft, and if you recall here, the Fine Touch, the Up and Up, and the Artist's Loft here, they were more on the harder side with the Artist's Loft being kind of in the middle. So here what I noticed is that when I put them on top of the Prismacolor, they were the fastest to create what we call a wax bloom. Now a wax bloom is when 
the wax begins to create a shine. Now that means that the wax is no longer being spread across the tooth of your paper. The tooth is the surface of your paper and you need a certain amount of tooth to be intact on your paper. The tooth of the paper is kind of like this. And when you have a stronger tooth, you have these little divots that go inside. If you mash them down by coloring hard, you smash the tooth of the paper. When you smash the tooth of the paper, it cannot accept any more pigment. So what happens is that these three here, when I combined them with my Prismacolor, I hit a wax bloom, which means that for some reason, they layered on top of each other to the point where they were not gonna take any more pigment. That wax shine can be used to your advantage if you were doing, say, um, the shine of an apple, or if you were doing uh, lips or a water drop and you wanted it to be a little bit shiny, that could be something that you use to your advantage in, in creating a wax bloom. But most people that are doing coloring don't find that necessarily desirable because then that means that you're at the end of your blending. The Faber-Castell and the Coronor, I did not have any wax bloom and I didn't have any with the Crayola in this particular example. So here I want to talk a little bit about blending. Blending seems to be something that either people are really excited to try or they're real nervous to try and I want to give you just a couple of different ways to approach it. Blending can be done where you do layers of your pencil and you just simply add darker layers and it can create a little bit of a vignette from dark to light. Now here's the trick with pencils. Pencils do best, remember I was talking about the tooth of the paper? Pencils do best if they are sharp because then they can get into the tooth of the paper when they are sharp. When they are dull, they tend to go on the surface of the tooth of the paper and that's when you end up with a lot of white showing through. So the sharper your pencil, and I'll show you an example of, like here's a really sharp pencil. This one's a little bit duller compared to that. The sharper your pencil, the more coverage that you're gonna get into the depths of the tooth of the paper. Because of working with a sharp pencil, you are also going to wanna work slowly. So what I mean by slowly is usually it's something like either doing little circles, or soft little strokes. But the trick to keeping your pencil sharp longer is to rotate your pencil. So if I, I'll put the Prismacolor up so that you can see what I'm doing. So if I do a little bit of coloring here in a circle, and then I rotate my pencil, and I do a little bit more coloring, and I rotate my pencil, and I do a little bit more coloring, and I rotate my pencil, I'm basically using all surface sides of the pencil. So if you think of how women's lipstick is, or yeah, probably like a lipstick, if they use the one side constantly, you end up with this funny little divot, right? Where the lips have run across. And the same thing happens with your pencil is that it can create sort of a flat spot on your pencil. So if you rotate it, you're more apt to keep that pointed tip, which means it's gonna keep this sharp edge a little bit longer and you can get into the depths of your tooth of the paper. So there I am just sort of rotating. Now the thing with rotating your pencil when you're coloring is that it sometimes in the beginning is something you have to think about. And that's okay. When we're learning something new or learning something technical, sometimes it involves a little bit more of our, our mind power to remember that that's what we need to do. But if you can take some time and be patient with adding your layers, don't go too fast, don't go too deep. You can actually create a lot of depth in your coloring. So here is an example of shading and blending with two different colors. So this was my first layer where I did just the purple, the violet. And my second layer was just adding a little bit of blue on top. Now the blue, when I add the blue, I do the same thing as my previous example where I do small little circles or small little stroke lines and I rotate my pencil. Not only does that practice sort of slow you down and give you a little bit more satisfaction of being connected with your pencil, but you want to remember that these pencils are tools. 
and you want to learn how to work with your tools. And so when you spend some time and you slow down a little bit, you can find out exactly how the Prismacolor works or how the Crayola works. And so slowing down and allowing yourself to create layers in, a, in more of a relaxed fashion is going to give you more blending results. One of the things that I studied in photography when I was in college was when we were in the dark room is that if you expose the light too quickly, you kind of flash your page. But if you take your time in the exposure and you go a little slower, you can really show off shadows in a completely different way and pick up details that would have been missed otherwise. And the same lesson is actually applied here. The slower that you move, the more time that you're willing to put into something, the different result that you will get then if I just took this place here and I just went in. See, now I'm going to create a saturation. I'm not going to see my purple as much, but I can begin to create a different blending if I go in. Here I want to show you a way to create a softer look when you begin to move colors together. So here I have just an example of where I took the colors from before. I did a layer of purple, I did a layer of blue, and then I went back on top and I added another layer of purple just in this back area here and just kind of faded that out. One of the neat things about working with pencil is because it is wax, it moves. Now, with wax, there is a way to move it in a, in a really cool, easy fashion using a white pencil. So here's an example of where I used a white pencil directly over these, and it begins to soften it. So I will show you what I did here, just on this side. And I'm just going to use this white pencil, and I'm just doing small little circles. And what the white pencil does, because it is made out of the same binding agents as the pigment, it's going to create a softer movement of those colors, and it's going to blend it in a nice, nice way that you wouldn't get otherwise. Now here, this is where I used a colorless blender. A colorless blender, this one's from Prismacolor, is made out of the same binding agents that your pencil is made out of, and it can move the wax without applying pigment. So while here, it added a little white on top of it, and I could go back and I could add one of my colors again if I wanted to. Here, there is no, there's no white added to it. So the colors maintain it's just the pigment, the, the, it's just that the binding agents in the colorless blender are now moving the colors around. So I'll show you on this example here. I will leave the white there, and at the top here, I will use the blender. And I do the same thing as I was recommending with a pencil, where I move it small little circles or gentle strokes and then rotate my pencil just in my hand so I'm using the edge differently than if I were just to flatten one side. So you can see where the pencil was by itself, the white blender, which is just a simple white pencil, and this is a colorless blender, which is basically just like a pencil, has the same binding agents, but has no pigment added. Here's an example of getting an idea of what I thought I was going to color and having it change before my eyes. And you might find as you begin to play with color pencils that you have an idea of what you think you want it to be, and as soon as you start to put the colors down, they begin to change. So this is another work in progress, obviously. There's lots of white areas here. But what I want to point out to you is these little spaces in here. So one of the things that I did was I, I did a, uh, a darker application of the pencil right in the corner and did a lighter. I just lightened my pressure and just allowed that pencil to be real light so that I could create kind of a, a, a rounded effect when it moved from the corner tips inside. But the other thing that I did is, remember I was talking to you about the white pencil? 
and how you can use it for blending well here's another thing is you can use any light colored pencil if you wanted to so I actually used this one's called sky blue light and that's what I did in these little areas here is that I actually just used this light blue color and I even did it all the way up into the corners here to create change to create a softer look to it without taking away with the white pencil but still using the same type of application just using a different lighter color so that's something that you can keep in mind with that now if I wanted to out of, out of curiosity while I've got you here let's just see what happens if I use this right down the center of this guy here I'm going to turn my page let's see what kind of blended effect I get and I don't know if you're paying attention to see that I'm actually rotating my pencil as I go and doing more of these little small circles. And one other little thing I want to mention about blending is there are these things called blending sticks or blending stumps. And the one that I'm going to show you today is pressed paper. There are some that are rolled paper, and I like the rolled paper when I'm working with graphite, but I do like the pressed paper when I'm working with pencil. So you can see there's a little bit of blue right on the tip of this right here. That's where I used it on the pencil. And so this is another way, if I didn't have a colorless blender or if I didn't have, um, uh, say, a, a a fancy light blue pencil or something in the color spectrum that I was working with, I could use these blending tools here, these blending stumps. So I'm just going to use this right in here just to see if you can. It doesn't move it quite the same way. Well, it's moving it because I can see a little bit here at the tip. I was going to see if it would move it in a way that would be more dramatic for you to see, but I, what I'm seeing is that it, there's a softening, but I don't know if it's going to be enough for you to see on the video. I'm going to use the tip right here on these little places. Actually, here, let's try this. Let's see if this will help you see this. Yeah, that will help you see it a little bit more. So this does not have any of the binding material of the pencil. It simply is moving the wax because this this is a paper product that is pushing the wax. So this is something that you can use if you don't have a colorless blender. It's also something you can use if you don't have a blender for that particular type of pencil. The one thing you need to, to keep in mind is that this is paper and it does pick up the wax and so I don't know if I would be taking this blue tip and putting it on say a bright yellow area someplace else on my page. You might want to have blending sticks of different colors. In other words, this might be all blues. I might have another one that is for my yellows, um, another one for my reds, just so that you can kind of keep the blending kind of clean for yourself. And let's see what this does for you here. Since this is mostly all in the blues area, I can go ahead and use this pretty much for everything. I don't think I will use it on my orange, though. Now, one thing here is that I did a couple of different layers of uh, blues and greens right along the edge here because I wanted to create a little bit of depth. And I'm just going to soften that with this here, with this blending stump. And I'm doing little circles from the center out so that it creates sort of this coming in towards the center of the body here. And again, this doesn't have to be a lot of pressure. You don't have to do a lot of pushing down to create a change. It's not about pressing hard. Coloring should not be about pressing hard with any of your materials. As a matter of fact, if you're pressing too hard, you need to take a look at what you're doing probably in the other areas of your life because that indicates a bigger energetic implication of how you're using your energy. The tools and coloring are actually tools and being able to help you with life, relax and let go just a little bit at a time. Images that were used today are from the Artful Mandala coloring book, Creative Designs for Fun and Meditation. Thanks for joining me. 
I'm Cher Kaufman. Until next time, from the drawing desk, may you find more color in your day.